Fasting is an institution as old as Adam. It is nature's ancient universal remedy for many problems. Animals instinctively fast when they become ill. We go on vacation from work to relax, recharge and to regain new perspectives in our life. Why do we not take occasional breaks from food? Though we generally think of fasting when people hear about Muslims fasting, they know Ramadan. Every year, Muslims fast for that one month, 30 days. However, that is the obligatory principle of fasting. But this period of fasting doesn't represent the totality of fasting in Islam. The principles of fasting, because they address so many different aspects of human psychology, physical needs, material needs, their emotional needs, this is not restricted only to one time in the year. And that's why the principle of fasting in Islam includes the whole year. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and all three fathers of Western medicine, Hippocrates, Galen, and Paracelsus, practiced and believed in fasting. On behalf of the American people, including Muslim communities in all 50 states, I want to extend best wishes to Muslims in America and around the world. Ramadan Karim. Ramadan is the month in which Muslims believe the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, beginning with a simple word, Ikra. It is therefore a time when Muslims reflect upon the wisdom and guidance that comes with faith, and the responsibility that human beings have to one another and to God. <laughs> All right, so that's a good question. People ask, why is it that if Allah wants me to worship more, why should I fast, not eat and not drink? How does not eating and not drinking help me focus better, worship better, and recite more Quran during the day? And the scholars have a very nice answer to this. They say that when the stomach is full, the rest of the body parts become hungry. Your eyes become hungry, you know, your ears, all other parts, your desires, your lust increase. But when your stomach is hungry, the rest of your body parts become full. And if we were to take the example, if there's someone that's in the desert, let's say, or someone who's starving and he's really, really hungry and needs to eat first, do you think this person has time for gossip? No, because his ears become full. Do you think he has time to listen to anything that's haram? No, because his stomach is empty, his ears are, ears are full. Do you think he has time to look at haram things? Is that the main concern? Like, he's really starving, he needs to eat, and his main concern is, let me find something haram to look at? No, because now his eyes become full and his private parts become full. So as the stomach becomes empty, the rest of the body parts are full. It kills, يعني, in other words, it kills all your other desires. And now you can focus on other things. You can focus on Quran, you can focus on Allah, you can focus on your worship and improving your acts of worship. And that's the whole reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to put our food and drink aside so we can worship and focus on some other things. A lot of people, they're fasting. And a lot of people, if you ask them, what is the definition of fasting? They tell you, fasting is when you don't eat and you don't drink from sunup until sundown. And this is the childhood definition, but people still use it. Fasting is when you don't eat and don't drink from sunup to sundown. You know, fasting and the word psalm, it means to abstain. So it's not just abstaining from food and drink, but it's abstaining from everything else that's bad. From lying, you know, from cheating, from using prof profanity, from anything else that is bad. Not just eating and drinking. Unfortunately, people now, they focus on what goes into their mouth and nobody cares what comes out of their mouth. You'll find someone who's so adamant to not get a drop of water in his mouth. They make wudu and they spit a hundred times after wudu to make sure that not the slightest amount of wetness goes into their throat. But then they don't care what comes out of their mouth. And so you find them during the day in Ramadan and they are backbiting, they are spreading rumors, they are lying, they are using bad words, they are cursing 
but yet at the same time they exaggerate about other things that are permissible. Don't take a shower in Ramadan because you know the cold water will hit your ears. Who drinks from his ears? They tell you don't even smell good food, don't use cologne. All these things are not even required in their religion. But their main concern is nothing goes in and yet they don't care about what comes out. So one of the things about acts of worship is that they're to impact the way you behave. And so fasting is supposed to impact your manners and your behavior and the language that you use and make you more truthful and not lie and so on and so forth. So it's not just about what goes in, but more importantly, it's about what comes out. All right, the whole idea of the month of Ramadan is that we're supposed to acquire good deeds and habits during the month that will continue for the rest of the year. All right. Now what happens usually, unfortunately, is two, people have two different lifestyles. Lifestyle A, which is how I live outside of Ramadan, and lifestyle B, which is how I change in Ramadan. So in Ramadan, they read Quran, they pray, they fast, they don't lie, they don't use profanity, the guy who smokes stops smoking, the guy who bites his fingernails stops biting his fingernails. Every possible improvement, they make it in Ramadan. And then when Eid comes, they go back to lifestyle A. Ramadan's over, the Qur'an goes back in the shelf, collects dust, stops fasting for the whole year, stops all the other kinds of good deeds, stops giving in charity, stops being generous, because they went back to lifestyle A. You know, when you hear the scholars talking about, about Ramadan, they always refer to it as a school, as a madrasa. That you're supposed to learn something in this school that you continue for the rest of the year. So it's not just that I'm good in Ramadan, and I can move back to being whatever I am outside of Ramadan. It's for me to acquire good habits during the month and continue them for the rest of the year. I'm going to tell you a quick true story. This actually happened. And in a Muslim country, there was a man who only prayed in Ramadan. Outside of Ramadan, he stopped praying immediately. So in that country, they announced Eid on television. When Eid is the next day, Ramadan's over, they announce it in the news. He was praying Isha. And while he was praying, the news was, was on, the TV was on, and my uncle saw this with his own eyes. The reporter said that tomorrow is Eid, and the guy went out of his prayer. I know this is an extreme example, but all of us do this in varying degrees. We have how we behave in Ramadan, and how we change, and the whole idea is to not change, inshallah. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ told us that the believer eats for one stomach, whereas the hypocrite eats for seven. And there's very different ways that uh, we could understand this hadith. But one is that, alhamdulillah, the believer, whatever they participate in, is full of barakah, it's full of blessing. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses it. From that we, we understand that a lot of benefit comes out of a very small amount. So the amount of food may be small, but the benefit that Allah allows the believer to take from it is a lot. Whereas the hypocrite, of course, is someone who outwardly professes to be a Muslim. But in reality, they conceal those attributes of being a disbeliever. And so that's the nature of disbelief, in a sense, is that nothing really satisfies that person because their heart, their soul, their mind is really connected to the world and the things of the world and this, these worldly things never give real satisfaction. The real, the real satisfaction comes from knowing Allah, remembering Allah and worshipping Him and that's what gives rest to the soul, that's what gives satisfaction to the heart and the soul and the heart of course connected to the body so if the soul is at rest, the heart is at rest, then also the body of the believer see, feels satisfied. Whereas, of course, the exact opposite is the case for the hypocrite. And that's why they eat for seven stomachs, whereas the believer eats for one. So the Qadha fast in Islam is a concession that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made for three types of people. Number one, for the woman. When a woman is in her menstrual cycle, she is not allowed to fast the month of Ramadan. So those days that she misses in the month of Ramadan, she is expected to make up outside of Ramadan before the next Ramadan actually comes. The second category of people are those who are traveling. So individuals who travel on business or even people who are traveling on pleasure, 
those fasts that they missed uh, while traveling, they're expected to make up after the month of Ramadan, before the next Ramadan as well. And the last category are those people who are sick. So an individual who is sick and fasting may be harmful towards his health, then he is allowed to skip fasting that day, and then he can make up that fast outside the month of Ramadan, bi ta'ala. The key thing being before the next Ramadan, bi ta'ala. All praise are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad forever. Alhamdulillah, the month of Ramadan uh, is upon us. And this is a time of fasting, a time of struggling, a time of joy, a time of uh, reflection. The creator of the heavens and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem, shahru ramadana ladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an, hudan lil-nasi wa bayyinatin min al-huda wal furqan that the month of Ramadan is that time in which the Qur'an was revealed as a guidance to humanity and clear evidence from the guidance and from the furqan, that which separates truth from falsehood. So Ramadan in its essence is not just a time of fasting, that the basis of it is a fast uh, from dawn to sunset, but it really is a time of reflection, it is a time of taqwa, because we know that our Creator has told us clearly and speaking to believers, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ya ayuha ladina amun attaqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Allah told us, O you who believe, you know, fear your Lord in the way he should be feared and do not die except in a state of Islam. And that it is through this month we are able to fulfill our Islam. And the essence of the month is not just physical, it is taqwa. So in a sense that you know, through the, 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 the uh, gaining of the consciousness of Allah, we are able to uh, fulfill our Islam. And so this month is really um, a, a month of striving. It is a, a month of spirituality. Uh, it is a month in which we are able to improve our lives and to, and to come together with our brothers and sisters throughout the world uh, in this beautiful fast and to really uh, increase our taqwa, to increase um, our level of Islam and inshallah we can gain success in this life and the hereafter. The relationship between, between fasting and controlling one's desire is a very direct and correlated one. If you were to look at the advice of the Prophet ﷺ and the advice he gave to the young men who are unable to get married, he advised them to control their desires through fasting. And the wisdom behind this is that an individual who is thinking about food will not have time to think about his other desires. So therefore, when one is hungry and feeling thirsty, this is a natural instinct that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us and it overpowers the other desires. So by keeping oneself hungry and by keeping oneself thirsty, one won't have time to be distracted by other desires. And this was the advice of the Prophet sallallahu So fasting, it helps control one's uh, physical desires as well as other desires as well. And this is what we hope to attain through the blessed month of Ramadan that one controls their physical urges through the day and is allowed to fulfill them during the night with their spouses, bi ta'ala. When you break your fast, there are some very good reasons why you shouldn't overeat. Um, of course, on the top of those reasons is that the Prophet wasallam warned us in general, and not just in the Ramadan, but this is generally true at any time, he warned us about overeating. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said that enough for the son of Adam is what keeps his back straight. In terms of food, it's enough just to eat what keeps you alive. But if it happens that you have to eat more than that, then the maximum that you should eat is a third of your stomach for food, a third for drink, and the rest should be, as the Prophet said, left for air. So that is what the Prophet wasallam said, is that the normal habit for a Muslim should be to only eat what is enough to keep them going. Um, there are some other reasons why it's just not a good idea to eat a lot in Ramadan. Of course, it's really not very healthy for you uh, to overeat when you break your fast. And the other reason is it'll be very, very hard for you to concentrate on the 
night prayers if you're really bloated all you're going to be thinking about is the pain that you're suffering in your stomach and you won't be able to concentrate on the salah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as-salatu wa sallam rasulullah wa ba'd um, Laylatul Qadr is the night of power and destiny and we know that um, in the chapter of the Qadr itself that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, has revealed to us Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr wa ma adraka ma Laylatul Qadr Laylatul Qadri khayrun min alfi shaha tanazzalul malaikatu wa ruhu fiha bi idni rabbihim min kulli am salamun that verily we have revealed this Qur'an in the night of power and destiny and what will explain to you what the night of power and destiny is the night of power uh, is better than 1000 months in it the angels descend dealing with all types of affairs and Jibreel salam descends and there is peace until the coming of the dawn and so this is a time when there is absolute peace in the spiritual world, when the angels descend, and, and, and when the destiny of human beings is being written, you know, and when um, we are able to gain uh, the, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, in a sense, um, in a way that you will never see in any other time of the year, because you know, as Allah told us, it is better than 1,000 months. And this is an amazing hour. So this will give us uh, for our prayers and our fasting, our sadaqah, and all the different aspects you know, of our striving you know, in this night, great blessings. And this would fall according to the Prophet, peace be upon him, you know, in the last 10 days, the odd nights of the last 10 days. The strongest, of course, the original is the 27th, but we will look for it in the 21st, the 23rd, the 25th, the 27th, or the 29th. And so it is a time of prayer, it is a time of struggling, it is a time of worship, it is a time of reaching out to the Creator. Um, you know, it is a time that we should not miss and, and, and we should strive you know, to get as close as possible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed occasion. One of the reasons why many people choose Ramadan as a time to give zakah is because first of all it's very easy to remember that that is the time to give zakah zakah is one it is very very important that zakah is paid on its time it is one of those acts of worship actually as many acts of worship that should not be delayed and uh, when one does delay paying one's zakah it deprives your wealth of a lot of blessing so therefore it's very important to choose a date that you can remember and what better time than to choose a specific date in Ramadan also many people choose Ramadan as a time to give zakah because it is a month of blessings where the benefit of deeds are increased so a lot of people choose Ramadan as a time to give zakah because of the increased rewards and blessings of giving charity at that time. So the compulsory fast in Islam is actually one of the pillars of Islam that Islam lays its foundation upon. The blessed month of Ramadan is a month that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran in. And this is the month that Muslims, they fast the whole month. So starting from sunrise to sunset, they will not eat or drink or fulfill any of their physical desires. Likewise, they will not uh, incur any form of sin and abstain from any form of sin. And any sin that they do commit is actually multiplied, just like any good deed that they perform during this time is multiplied as well. So to summarize the compulsory fast, before sunrise you're allowed to eat and drink as much as you like. And the second the adhan for fajr is given, then an individual abstains from eating and drinking and from physical relations. During this time from sunrise to sunset, it is encouraged that one performs extra good deeds, recitation of the Qur'an, um, you know, goodness towards one's parents, righteousness towards one's neighbor, what any, any other form of good deeds that you can perform during this time is highly encouraged as well. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ba'd. The Eid al-Fitr really is the 
culmination of the month of the fasting. And, and this is the festival you know, of the breaking of the fast. And uh, it is a time when Muslims come together and uh, they celebrate you know, their, their struggle of the month. They're able to reunite with their family members. They, they reach out to the poor. Um, they are able to uh, bring together the community. Um, it is important on this time that all the members of the family come out to the occasion of the Eid. And the Prophet ﷺ would pray in the Musalla and he would ask his companions, even young uh, girls, you know, um, on their monthly courses, come out, you know, to the Musalla. It's not a masjid. You know, witness, you know, this gathering of the believers. So, you know, in a sense, you know, it, it is a time that you connect uh, with the whole community and the Imam uh, at that point should be delivering a message, you know, which would re inspire the people, remind them of taqwa, you know, you know, making prayers for them and, you know, celebrating with them, you know, the great triumphs uh, of the month of Ramadan. So, so it is so important, you know, that people look upon this occasion, you know, as a sacred time, you know, and, and, and something that the children will always look forward to. In many countries, people do not give emphasis to the Eids. They will give more emphasis to secular holidays and secular vacations. But these are the times that the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his companions would make their takbirs loudly in the streets. You know, the whole city is, is filled with joy and sharing and giving and all the people are eating food. So it is a time that we need to come together and, and we need to fulfill the needs uh, of the poor and the needy uh, during this time. Eid al-Fitr, um, you know, has become, for some people in distant parts of the world, it is a means of survival. Because it, it, it is really a time, you know, when the community puts together its food, uh, it, it, it puts their, hand, their hands together, you know, and, and the community is able to maintain uh, its culture uh, in distant lands. And so the Eid al-Fitr has so many meanings uh, to people, and it is so important for Muslims and especially those in the younger generation uh, to be part of this international celebration where people all over the planet you know, are literally breaking their fast and they are coming together on this occasion. So I pray that this would be a successful one for the Muslims throughout the world. And in it we will gain the, the blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal and freedom uh, from the fire. On the outside, everything looks good. You see the hundred thousand dollar cars. You see a lot of diamonds. You see a lot of females, and they think that this is, you know, this is the life. This is, this is like, you know, paradise right here on earth. It's not anyone's job to go into someone's heart and change their heart. Your job is to tell people what the truth is. And the reality of it is, while we're sitting here, while I'm sitting here constantly paying for the disease, the cure was free. Islam, which means to acquire peace by submitting your entire self to the owner of peace, the one God, the same God of Noah, Abraham, and the last and final messenger sent to mankind of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Islam is based on these five pillars, and fasting is one of them. But before we can get to even fasting, you've got prayer, and you also have the main pillar, which is to worship none but the one God to worship the same way all the messengers of God worship. They didn't worship men, monkeys, saints, and elephants. They worship the creator of man, monkey, saints, and elephants. That God who created the sun and the moon, who created this whole universe and everything in it, that God is to be singled out from his creation, and he is the only one to be worshipped, the one God. And then you need to obey the messenger. And the last final messenger is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And then we come to the fasting. Fasting was prescribed, it was prescribed to those before us so we may attain God consciousness, so we can become more pious, righteous, and to develop ourselves to be the best human beings that we can possibly be. A great emphasis has been placed in Islam on how we eat. Uh, how much do we eat? That moderation as a general principle is the framework in which all of our practices should be 
and in particular in the area of eating because eating represents one of the most basic desires of human beings. It's driven by the need for survival and above that the desire for the pleasure of food. This is a, a great uh, pressure that all human beings face which is fed of course by the media, uh, the lovely foods and things that are prepared, it's huge businesses and everything behind it. All of which which drives people to overeat. Whereas from an Islamic perspective, keeping our uh, principles applied in our daily lives requires that we eat in moderation. And Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, did address this 1,400 years ago. He spoke about this concept and he said that the believer eats as if he has or she has one stomach. The disbeliever as if they have seven. This is a, because there are no rules, no guidelines which controls how much they should eat. So they can eat till they are sick. But for the believer, no. He eats as if he has only one stomach. And in that one stomach, the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, added further clarification by saying that the believer should eat a third, drink a third, and leave a third for breathing. That we should never actually fill the stomach. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ added to that that the worst thing, worst vessel that a human being can fill is his stomach or her stomach. So even the concept of filling the stomach is not uh, within the bounds of Islamic law and Islamic life and culture. So moderation in all things and especially in eating. Even after the month of Ramadan, the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, had recommended for Muslims that they fast an additional six days from the month after it, known as Shawwal. Any six days. This fasting the Prophet recommended, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, saying that one who fasts for these six days, along with Ramadan, gets the reward of fasting the whole year. Because in general, general principle in Islam is that one day of fasting or one good deed is equal to 10. So 30 days is 300 days, six more days makes 60 days, 360 days we've covered the year. Also besides that, Prophet Muhammad recommended that we fast every Monday and Thursday. Every Monday and Thursday of every week. He also recommended that we fast the 13th, 14th and 15th of every lunar month. These are the days of the full moon. And also the 10th of Muharram, the first uh, month of the lunar calendar. On the 10th we're recommended to fast. So the principle of fasting is something which continues throughout the whole year. Because the benefits that one stands to gain from it are not limited to only a particular time of the year. So in Islam, fasting is a way of life. The month of Ramadan is the month which we are fasting. But why Ramadan? Why this ninth month? Why? Because Allah, God Almighty, stated in the Quran, Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. The month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed. So Allah has linked the revelation of the Quran with Ramadan. This was a blessed month. This is where the final revelation of God to humankind began. As such, that month was given the special status to be the month of fasting. So Ramadan is a month of Quran. This is how Muslims generally look at it. And that's why you find that Muslims will try to read the whole Quran during this month. 
Although reading of the Quran should be throughout the year, but especially in this month, it was the practice of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, to recite the whole of the Quran from beginning to end during this month. People learned the Quran from him in this way. They memorized it. They wrote it down in this period. So this month has the special significance, the special importance in that the Quran, the final revelation of God to man, took place in this month. The main purpose of fasting in Islam has actually been defined by God in the Quran. It's not left up to human beings to philosophize as to why do we fast. Allah very clearly said in the second chapter of the Quran, Kutiba alaykum siyamu kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun. Fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you in order that you be conscious of God, that you gain what is called taqwa. Taqwa meaning an awareness and a consciousness of God. So this is the main goal of fasting. How is that achieved? When one becomes hungry, what is the relationship between that and God? One could say, well, you become hungry, you're concerned about food. That would bring you closer to food or being more concerned about food. But no, because of the fact that people are choosing not to eat food. Of course, if you're, if you're hungry because food is not available, then your main concern is going to be food. When you decide yourself not to eat, now you're not eating because this is a commandment of God. And who knows whether you eat or you don't eat? Only God. Because you can always slip away when people are not watching you and eat something. You can have things in your pocket, things in your office. People don't know. Apparently you're fasting, but in fact you're not. So therefore, this is something what stops you from, fast, from not eating is your consciousness of God. So this heightens your consciousness. As you have the desire to want to eat, you remember you've made this commitment to God. So this helps to bring you closer to God and be, to be aware of God throughout your life. I mean, this is the goal. This is the main goal, to be conscious of God. Because the goals of fasting, the main goal of fasting is consciousness of God, it makes sense then that this principle must have existed with the religion of God from the very beginning. When God prescribed the religion for the first human beings, Adam and Eve, part of that prescription would have been fasting because the need to be conscious of God is not something which only came along you know, 1,400 years ago, how many thousands of years after the time of Adam and Eve? No, that is a need which existed right from the very beginning. And that is why past fasting has been prescribed all along. And this is what Allah has stated in the Quran, كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ As it was prescribed for those before you. And that is why we find in Judaism, in Christianity, fasting existing. Even in Hinduism, Buddhism, in the various other religions, it's there. Our belief, of course, is that the origin was one religion, Islam. What we now know as Buddhism or Christianity or Judaism, these were uh, deviations and we could say a corruption of the original message. What was retained in that corruption is fasting. But the original message was one. The religion of Adam was Islam. So was the religion of Moses, of David, of Jesus, of Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be on all of them. Fasting benefits on a variety of different levels. On the ritual level, uh, where a person just fulfills the basic requirements of not eating from dawn until sunset, there is an element of discipline there. 
that one disciplines one's life. When one takes a hold of one's life and sets a period of time when they're not going to eat, it gives them a sense of control. This ritual practice gives them a sense of control over life. And this is something important because for a lot of people when they fall into depression, it is a result of them feeling that life has slipped out of their hands, the control over their lives lost. So this can help even in people who are in states of depression. That's why fasting has a benefit even to those who are depressed, that it helps to give them a sense of control which they're losing. But that's on the ritual level. And of course, this is really only beneficial if we take that ritual level to the spirit, to, to the physical level. And this is really only beneficial if the person follows the principles that the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, set. Because though the rule says you don't eat after dawn and you eat at sunset, now people may eat huge meals for the dawn meal, suhoor. They may eat full meals so that they fill themselves up and then they spend the rest of the day, their bodies are just digesting this food till finally the digestion process ends just before Maghrib, just before the time to break the fast and then they go and they break the fast again with a full meal all the way until the morning. So they don't experience hunger at all. They have fulfilled the letter, the ritual letter of the law, but they haven't really fulfilled the spirit. So the spirit is and requires a light meal for suhoor. should be a light meal, very light meal. So that during the day of fasting, one experiences hunger. Because most of us never experience hunger really. The hunger pangs where we feel pain in our stomachs, you know, because we want, you know, it's empty, we want some food. To experience that hunger pang is an important part of fasting. Because what it does is it gives us a sense of empathy and sympathy for those who are feeling those same pangs of hunger, not because they chose not to eat, but because there's no food to eat. So when one experiences that, they have a sense of, of emotional and uh, psychological connection with those who are suffering that not by choice. And hopefully that would then motivate them to want to share with those who don't have anything to eat. So even on, the, on that physical level, where the fast is done according to the principles of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, then one benefits from that uh, experience of hunger, maybe for the first time in their lives, or first occasion in the year, or whatever. They experience it and can relate to those who are experiencing it starving around the world. Because otherwise, normally people talk about the starving millions. And it's just an idea, it's just a thought. Yes, people are starving, but what does it mean to starve? If we haven't experienced that hunger, real hunger, then it's difficult really to sympathize and be motivated to want to sacrifice for them. So here is a benefit, a real practical benefit from fasting in the correct way. Another of the benefits that come actually from the physical level of fasting, as medical experts have pointed out, that when a person fasts, it affects the endomorphin system in the body. That it causes the brain to produce more endomorphins, which are the basic elements which cause us to feel good, you know, where we uh, feel a sense of well-being. This is from the production of endomorphins in the system. Fasting causes the body to produce more. So it is good in terms of giving a person 
a sense of feeling good. And again, for those people who are depressed, this is very, very important. Also, medical experts have pointed out that fasting causes the body to start to consume the cholesterols. So it reduces the level of cholesterols in our systems. And as those people who are involved in weight loss and weight gain and all these type of things, dieting and that, they know it. a lot of it is related to cholesterol. So uh, fasting has been employed by many of the various dietary systems in order to, to uh, decrease weight. In Islam, I mean, our main goal is not to decrease weight. I mean, because you shouldn't have gained weight in the first place. You know, where people have, have warped the practice of Ramadan, uh, where it becomes a month of feasting instead of fasting, uh, you find people ending the month kilos more than they started the month. Of course, that, that's because they've, they've misunderstood. They are not following the principles. They're following the ritual, but not the true spiritual uh, guiding principles in fasting. So what weight loss takes place, and there should be weight loss, what weight loss takes place is healthy weight loss. It's not fasting to an extreme where it starts to become damaging to the system, but fasting in a controlled way where it is beneficial to the system. Fasting also affects human beings on the libidinal level, where our desires for sexual relations, are one of the basic drives that all human beings have, put in us for reproduction and procreation, it has a place, but where the media and uh, the world pumps this up to the point where we break laws and we are involved in all kinds of corruption, fasting helps to gain control of this, give people a sense of control over their physical desires. And that's why the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, had said, O oh, young people, those among you able to get married should get married. Those who are not able should fast because it breaks the desire. It is a means of decreasing the sexual desire. Fasting has that effect. So a person who fasts on a regular basis, then he or she has a good handle on their life. They have control over the natural desires. So they're not driven by the natural desires into a state of animal existence. Unfortunately, this is what has happened to much of the world, where people are just driven by desires. So fasting helps to put desires back under human control, especially sexual desires, because of course, we know fasting is not permitted, uh, sexual, sexual relations is not permitted during the daylight hours of fasting. So one may have the desire, but one puts a cap on it because of the fast. And the fast helps to reduce the desire, especially the last 10 days when the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, had recommended that we seclude ourselves in the mosques where we don't even involve, even in the nights, in sexual relations. So one third of the month, we're encouraged also to leave it all together just for that period to gain a greater sense of control over one's desires. He is the maintainer. Coming to the truth requires two things. It requires deep thinking that you've already done, but it requires another step and that's courage. If you have the truth, but you don't have courage, you won't stand up for the truth. And that's as good as standing up for falsehood. I, I would say this thing that you just told me, it's not in the scripture. And they would say, a marginal note added by a scribe, yeah, okay, we know that. And I'd be thinking, if you know this is not the Bible, why are you preaching it as if it's gospel truth? Fasting also has an emotional dimension. Among the biggest or greatest uh, drives that we have in an emotional level is anger um, and we express our anger by speaking ill of people 
by shouting, by you know, a variety of different ways. Fasting helps us to gain control over it. Because the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, had said that one who doesn't control his tongue or her tongue, so that they are backbiting, telling lies, screaming, shouting, etc., then he said, God has no need for their fast. There's no reward in that fast. So if one is not able to control one's emotions during the fast, then in fact one has nullified the value of the fast. So the fast challenges us on a variety of different levels. And this emotional level is a very critical level because isn't it where emotions go crazy, run awry, that we end up killing, hurting, screaming, the, a lot of the, the crime or the, the, the uh, abuse or these kind of things that happen in society, it's coming from on an emotional level. People who lack control over their emotions. So fasting addresses this topic, this issue directly. If one is serious about fasting, then they must put a handle on this. And fasting during this blessed month of Ramadan, the same way that all the messengers of God, they all fasted. But they also worshiped one God. They didn't worship multiple gods. They didn't worship a triune God. They didn't worship a man God. They didn't worship a monkey God. They didn't worship dead people in graves. They didn't call upon saints and idols. And, you know, it was the same way of life. That way of life that called a person to acquire peace by submitting yourself entirely to the owner of peace. Who, the owner of peace, is the one who created this whole planet, you, me, who created Jesus, Moses, and the last and final message sent to mankind of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They all worship the Creator and not what He created. And they all prayed the same way we're praying, falling on their face. We fall on our face, we prostrate to the one God, not to His creation, and we fast. And we fast because that helps us in so many ways, so many ways. There's so much wisdom behind it. You feel what it is to be hungry. You develop yourself to have better character, better manners, and so many other wonderful things. On a psychological level, fasting plays a major role in training the human being in principles of patience. We're living in a society where immediate gratification is a Premium. Everybody puts a premium on it. You want to be, to find whatever you want immediately. Whatever you desire, it should happen now. This sense of immediacy that we have, which is urgency. So fasting helps to settle things back down, put it in its proper place. Be patient. Be able. This is, this, this is a good life, uh, we could say life skills, you know, emotional psychological life skills which everybody needs to develop. Fasting promotes it because there is no immediate gratification. You fast, you have to wait till the end of the day before you can eat. You know, so it teaches you to delay. You can wait. You get a sense of, of control over your life again in the sense of not having a burning desire for immediate gratification. So this is very, very important because of the nature of the society in which we live today, which has promoted this concept of immediate gratification to the highest possible level. So people have no patience. Fasting teaches patience. Among the things which people are often plagued with is the desire for the things of this world that we become so attached to life in the sense of the material life that we can't find a sense of contentment. We're always after this and after that and after the other. When we've gotten this, then we want that. When we've gotten that, we want the other. We, that's life. We're just driven, running from pillar to post after the material things of the life. Fasting helps us to detach 
to detach us from the material life. Why? Because food is one of the most basic elements of material life. We can do without a house, but we can't do without food. So it is a basic drive. So where we're able to put it aside, this helps us to detach ourselves from the worldly life. So it doesn't become the be-all and the end-all for everything. That there are some things which are higher and greater, spiritual issues which go beyond who we are, who is our creator, what is our relationship with that creator, what is our purpose here in life. These are bigger questions that we need to address. And we don't need to be blinded by our needs and our desires for the worldly life, where we lose track of the more important aspects of our life. So fasting then helps us to detach. Not to detach ourselves totally because of course this is suicide. We're not trying to kill ourselves when fasting, no. We are only trying to reduce our attachment. And that is very, very important for us to really find contentment in this life. Fasting also addresses a spiritual need that we have, which is salvation from sin. One of the ways and the means by which we can remove sin from ourselves is through fasting. The Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, had said that whoever fasts Ramadan sincerely, Allah will forgive their previous sins. So it is a means of erasing sin. It doesn't mean, of course, that people say, well, okay, I'm going to be a sinner for the next uh, 11 months. And uh, when Ramadan comes along, I'm going to be a good Muslim and fast. And so my sins are all forgiven and I can be a sinner for the next 11. No, no, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Because if we are deliberate sinners for those 11 months, with the plan to remove the sin during Ramadan, What's going to happen is we're going to be sinners in Ramadan. It's not going to do the job. This is about sincerity. Whoever fasts Ramadan sincerely. You can't fast Ramadan sincerely and then plan to sin for the next 11 months. <laughs> this just doesn't go together. I mean, on paper you can put it down or you can say it, but reality is not the case. So a person who, as human beings, we commit sins. We have errors, we try to turn back to God, seek His forgiveness, etc. throughout the year. In this month where we sincerely fast, it helps to erase whatever we are unable to erase. If we are sincere, sincere with the fast. So it has this purifying quality to it. Fasting in Ramadan erases the sins of the previous. So on this level, on the spiritual level, fasting plays an important role in giving a person a sense of becoming pure, removing from oneself sin, corruption, and evil, moving towards goodness. This is a spiritual need which we all have. And the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, had said that one who fasts through Ramadan and didn't get his sins erased, he has played with the fast. The fast is not the real fast. This is an opportunity which a person has which no one can afford to let go. So it's very important for us when we go into the fast of Ramadan as Muslims, we should be very sincere and very careful about this month. As non-Muslims, of course, a person is not obliged to fast this month, but to experience what it is like, I would encourage you, find out, experience and see the benefits that can come from it. Fasting is prescribed by God for all of humankind. Only Muslims are really doing it now, but it was prescribed 
for all of humankind. Islam is a religion which puts great emphasis on communal worship, that we worship God together. We see it in our daily prayers. We gather together in the mosques and we pray. The Hajj, where people gather together and make pilgrimage to Mecca. Fasting also is a collective act of worship. We fast together. Though individually, it's between the individual and God. In the end, it's all man and God, woman and God, you know, and as an individual, we have to reconcile ourselves with God. But that individual act is strengthened and supported by the collective participation of the society as a whole. And that's what fasting in the month of Ramadan is. The rest of the recommended days are up to individuals. You fast maybe collectively with your family or maybe only you yourself or whatever. But at least once in the year for that full month of Ramadan, the whole of the Muslim world fasts together. It is a collective act of worshiping God. It reminds us of the collective, that we are a part and parcel of one human race who have a responsibility to worship God alone, to worship God collectively and to worship him individually. So the collective act of worship, fasting, is emphasized in Islam by the sighting of the moon, when everybody begins the fast, the sighting of the moon, when everybody ends the fast. And then after the fast itself, the very first day, the collective prayer, known as the Eid prayer, and the giving of Zakatul Fitr, which is charity given at the end of the fast. All of this is done collectively. So it is a part of the sharing, the feeling of fasting and coming close to God together, which heightens that overall feeling in the individual. Fasting is a collective duty as well as an individual duty in Islam. Do you want to know what makes the knowledge grow? Then everybody watch the show. Are you ready? Your host is ready. If there is something you want to know, if there is something you so want to know, sit right back and watch Dean Show. The Dean Show.